Vanessa and I have some exciting news for you. Starting now, you can listen to Cults episodes that are older than six months completely ad-free, exclusively on Stitcher Premium. We're always looking for ways to improve the listener experience. We found an amazing partner in Stitcher to bring you episodes ad-free six months after they're released. Again, this will only affect episodes that are older than six months. Nothing else will change. We'll still be releasing new Cults episodes wherever you listen to podcasts. For a free month trial, go to stitcherpremium.com slash parcast and use promo code parcast. That's stitcherpremium.com slash parcast and use promo code parcast. The world of organized crime is a treacherous landscape that rewards both ruthless order and violent impulse. How do these hardened men and women rise out of their communities and to the top of the criminal underworld? And what ultimately brings them down? Listen to new episodes of Kingpins every Friday. Search Kingpins wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe now. And stay tuned to the end of this show for a sneak peek of the first episode of Kingpins. Due to the graphic nature of this cult's crimes, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of graphic material that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for listeners under 13. Midnight, San Francisco. A balmy Friday in 1964. A small group of individuals enter a sinister black Victorian house perched on California Street, the group is comprised of artists, doctors, policemen, academics. They shuffle into the living room of the old Victorian, unsure of what to expect. Immediately, they are taken aback by the interior, the walls adorned in skulls, candles, and satanic symbols. As the group settles, a tall, black-clad figure emerges and takes his place at an altar at the front of the room. He's pale-skinned and entirely bald except for a dark black goatee. The group descends into total silence. This mysterious man is the reason they're all here. He begins to speak to them about cannibalism and human sacrifices. He's engaging, almost professorial, as he regales them with grisly and shocking stories. The group hangs on his every word. As his lecture comes to an end, a woman enters the room holding a silver platter containing fried bananas and yams. At the center of the platter, the cooked thigh of a human woman. Tonight, this would be their feast. Hi, I'm Greg Polson. And I'm Vanessa Richardson. And this is Cults. Today we're taking a deep dive into the Church of Satan, founded by Anton LaVey, arguably the most famous Satanist in history, and the man responsible for introducing Satanism to Hollywood. You can listen to previous episodes of Cults, as well as all of ParCast's other shows, wherever you listen to podcasts. A new episode comes out every Tuesday. Many people ask how they can help support the show. And if you enjoy the podcast, the best way to do that is to leave a five-star review. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram as at Parcast and on Twitter at Parcast Network. When Anton Zandor LaVey founded the Church of Satan in 1966, he wanted to make Christianity, which he saw as fostering stupidity and dull complacency, obsolete. This was an organization for non-joiners, the alienated individuals who rejected traditional religion and instead adopted Satan, the original rebel, as their patron. Anton LaVey founded the church out of his home in San Francisco, a Victorian home that was dubbed the Black House. His many followers would gather here to bear witness to his weekly satanic rituals. In 1969, he published the Satanic Bible, which has been described as the most important document to influence contemporary Satanism. At the height of his fame, LaVey was considered by many to be the real-life incarnation of Satan. In fact, he was so synonymous with the devil that when people would address mail to Satan, the post office would deliver it directly to him. LaVey hobnobbed with movie stars and boasted of affairs with Marilyn Monroe and Jane Mansfield. 
he was high priest of the church until his death in 1997. In 2001, Peter H. Gilmore was appointed as his successor, a position he still holds to this day. The organization's headquarters has since moved to Hell's Kitchen in New York City. Since the organization has never disclosed official membership numbers, the number of church followers is a mystery to this day. Some estimates place membership as high as 20,000, others as low as 300. This week, we're going to take a look at Anton LaVey and how he transformed from a simple circus musician into a figure many consider the most evil man in the world. Next week, we'll see how the Church of Satan grew in popularity to eventually become the largest satanic organization in modern times. But before we discuss the Church of Satan, we must examine the life of its leader. Anton LaVey was born Howard Stanton Levy on April 11, 1930 in Chicago, Illinois. His father was a liquor salesman named Michael Joseph Levy. His mother was Gertrude Augusta Coltrane. His Russian-born maternal grandparents, who immigrated to Ohio in 1893, became naturalized American citizens in 1900. Soon after he was born, LaVey's family moved to the San Francisco Bay Area, which is where he spent his childhood. According to LaVey, he had normal parents who had no interest in the dark side. LaVey said, quote, The story of my father's life was to blend into the woodwork. My mother was the same way. They were very paranoid about the neighbors and what people thought of them. In a way, it was good. I was allowed to take my own lead. In that sense, I couldn't have chosen better parents, end quote. LaVey described his religious background at this time as very iconoclastic and extremely permissive. His parents didn't participate in religion and never pushed him into it, going so far as to tell him that another word for God is nature. LaVey said, quote, We did have relatives who were Christian and Jewish. I had an aunt who was a Christian scientist and an atheist uncle. You could say I grew up a second-generation non-believer or cynic, end quote. LaVey, or Tony, as he was known then, began to play music at the age of five. He claims he went into a music store with his mother and spontaneously picked out a tune on a harp. His parents were supportive of his newfound interest, and he went on to try a number of different instruments, most notably the pipe organ and the calliope. This newfound passion would continue throughout his entire life. When LaVey was seven years old, he became obsessed with tales of the supernatural and occult. Too young to fully understand what he was reading, he turned to his maternal grandmother, Luba Colton, who regaled young Tony with the mysteries of her homeland, Transylvania. She told him of the legend of Dracula, about bloody battles fought against Turkish and Russian invaders, and between Hungary and Romania over the right of rule. She even told him about the eccentrics in his own family, including her brother, a bear trainer who traveled with carnivals and circuses from the Black Sea to Hungary. This latter detail would prove particularly influential later in Tony's childhood. According to LaVey, one thing the majority of Satanists have in common is that they were stigmatized as youths. It's this stigmatism that steers them towards Satanism later in life. His stigma, he claims, was his unattractive face. LaVey said, quote, I was odd looking. By today's standards, I would have looked fine. But in 1939, I was not cute. I was certainly not a Van Johnson or a John Wayne, end quote. He spoke of the horror of going to gym class with other boys, which was so great that he would get a doctor's note to avoid it. To some, this may not sound too dissimilar to what a lot of children experience in their early years. However, it appears LaVey also experienced another stigma as a child, the stigma of having a human tail. In Blanche Barton's authorized 1990 biography of LaVey, The Secret Life of a Satanist, she writes that Anton had an extra vertebrae removed near the end of his spine that formed a prehensile tail. This appendage occurs in about one in every 100,000 births. This tail gave Tony an enormous amount of trouble as an 11-year-old. He had to have it drained several times, and even learned to sit on chairs sideways as to avoid the pain. One night, when it became re-inflamed, Anton once again visited the hospital to have it drained. However, there were no rooms available at the hospital, so the doctors could only administer a local anesthetic. The pain was so great, Tony says, he bit through the rubber pad he was lying on and bent the steel bar on the side of the gurney. He eventually had the tail removed at the age of 12. 
By the age of 16, he was beginning to have his first romantic relationships with women. However, because of his already sinister appearance, most of his girlfriends chose to meet him in secret so that their parents wouldn't see the type of boy their daughter was keeping company. This was upsetting for Tony. He wished he could look normal like other boys his age. Vanessa is going to take over on the psychology here and throughout the episode. Please note, Vanessa is not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but she has done a lot of research for this show. Thanks, Greg. According to Psychology Today, children who experience betrayal, rejection, and other deep wounds are at risk of developing narcissistic personality disorder. These individuals spend their adult lives trying to fend off such feelings by acquiring success, wealth, celebrity, status, and power. When we look further into LeVay's adult life, we'll see that he seems to constantly seek out celebrity and power. This need is likely rooted in these negative early childhood experiences. It was also at age 16 that Tony had an experience he claimed would shape his taste in the opposite sex for the remainder of his life. Anton was at a house party with his friends when he walked into a room to find a group of teenagers wrestling. One of the teens was wrestling with a girl on the ground. At one point, her dress flipped up and her underwear was visible. According to Tony, in this moment, the sight of her white, plump thighs, blonde hair, and translucent skin caused him to experience what he terms erotic crystallization inertia, or ECI. Tony claims that ECI is the point at which a sexual archetype or fetish is fixed. The instant one's erotic instincts are first peaked lives perpetually in one's memory, as vivid and stimulating as the moment it first occurred. However, ECI is not a recognized psychological phenomenon, rather a term concocted by LeVay to explain that he would go on to be romantically involved with many women who shared a similar appearance, blonde hair and pale skin. This is an example of how LeVay has attempted to retroactively construct a tidy narrative of his own life. From an early age, people develop the cognitive skills needed to create a coherent life story for themselves. According to a 2011 study by Elaine Reese, these include causal coherence, the ability to describe how one event led to another, and thematic coherence, the ability to identify overarching values and motifs that recur throughout the story. The truth is, many of the significant moments in our lives are often random. As such, they may not always make for a good story. Anton, however, seems very adamant that the story of his life be an intriguing one. As we delve further, we'll see even more extreme instances of this. In 1946, likely inspired by the stories told to him by his grandmother, LeVay dropped out of his junior year of high school and joined the Clyde Beatty Circus. His first job there was playing Hammond organ accompaniment for circus acts. LeVay said, quote, I got to rub elbows with human oddities, freaks, dancers, showgirls who wanted to be stars. It was a chance to meet people who were really marginal, end quote. This was LeVay's first exposure to social outcasts, and he found that he felt at home among them. During this period, LeVay's musical talents led him to being recruited by traveling evangelists to play gospel tunes during their services. This inadvertently led him to having a critical insight into the nature of religion. LeVay said, quote, On Saturday night, I would see men lusting after half-naked girls dancing at the carnival. And on Sunday morning, when I was playing the organ for tent show evangelists at the other end of the carnival lot, I would see these same men sitting in the pews with their wives and children, asking God to forgive them and purge them of their carnal desires. And next Saturday night, they'd be back at the carnival or some other place of indulgence." End quote. LeVay concluded that the Christian church thrived on hypocrisy and that man's carnal nature would always win out. This idea would later become one of the founding principles of the Church of Satan. At age 17, LeVay began asking friends to call him Anton instead of his childhood nickname of Tony. By this point, Anton was not only playing music at the circus, he was taming eight Nubian lions and four Bengal tigers alone in the big cage. He developed a close relationship with and an affection for these big cats, which would last well into adulthood. During this time, LeVay also joined the carnival and amusement park circuit, working some of the biggest traveling shows on the Pacific coast. 
playing calliope, Wurlitzer band organ, or Hammond along every midway, LeVay found that he felt at home among the loners, drifters, and marginal types who were attracted to the cynical carnival atmosphere. According to LeVay, it was here that he learned how much people will pay to be fooled, how desperately they want to escape their own dull lives. One can't help but think that this revelation may have planted the seed for what would eventually become the Church of Satan. LeVay's image at this point had become that of a stereotypical carny, flashy sports coats, hand-painted ties, and a pencil-thin mustache. He was getting an education he could never get from a college, a confidence man's education in hustling and exploiting man's carnal nature. When the carnival closed for the season in the winter of 1948, 18-year-old Anton LaVey started playing burlesque houses in Southern California, in particular a theater called The Mayan in Los Angeles. This is where he claims he met his most famous romantic partner, Marilyn Monroe. Monroe was a long way from the Hollywood starlet she would later become. She was down on her luck and had taken up stripping to get by. LaVey said, quote, She was a very confused girl at that time, very depressed in many ways. It was probably the lowest point in her life until the time she died, end quote. LeVay, however, was immediately drawn to her unusually white skin tone. When he first saw her perform on stage, he described the erotic feeling that went through him as being identical to the one he experienced at the party as a 16-year-old. For her part, Marilyn was taken with LeVay, who played musical accompaniment to her act. Between performances that night, Anton approached Monroe and made some suggestions for songs to add to her routine. After impressing her with his accompaniment that night, they instantly became lovers. Although their time together was short-lived, they were inseparable and shared intense feelings for one another. LeVay moved into a cheap motel on Washington Boulevard with Monroe, who made more money than him at that time. She was fascinated with his stories from the carnival as well as his ever-deepening study of the black arts. While they drove through the deserted L.A. streets at night, Monroe would ask LeVay to tell her about occultism and death, subjects that he was more than happy to talk about. After only a few weeks, their relationship came to an end. While they would correspond sporadically for a decade, they would never meet again. Now, it should be mentioned that this account of LeVay's relationship with Monroe comes from his authorized biography, The Secret Life of a Satanist, which was written by Blanche Barton, a member of the Church of Satan. His version of events is challenged by those who knew Monroe, as well as the manager of the Mayan, Paul Valentine, who denies that Monroe was ever employed by him. This is yet another commonality between LeVay's mind and that of a narcissist. Narcissists compulsively create and perpetuate their own version of reality, twisting and distorting information to suit their own purposes. They do this not only to maintain their self-image in the eyes of the public, but also to maintain their own grandiose image and inflated assessment of themselves. By retroactively linking himself with Marilyn Monroe, Anton LaVey's name came to be associated with glamour, power, and success. We may never know the exact details of LeVay's relationship with Monroe, or whether it even existed. However, it is clear that by the summer of 1949, Los Angeles had lost its appeal for him. Realizing there was nothing keeping him there, he returned to San Francisco. After this short break, we'll follow LeVay to San Francisco. I see you're drinking Cafe Monster again. Why do you prefer Cafe Monster over traditional coffee drinks? I like the flavors. You can't go wrong with mocha or vanilla. And if I'm feeling a little extra daring, I'll go salted caramel. Mm, And you feel you get a boost? I definitely feel a boost. How can I not? It has 150 milligrams of caffeine from coffee beans, B vitamins, and coffee fruit extract. You don't miss getting coffee from the local coffee house? I certainly don't miss looking for parking and standing in line. Besides, Cafe Monster gives me all the same feel and flavor as my local coffee house. And I don't need to worry about anybody getting my name wrong. Those are good reasons to drink Cafe Monster. I drink it too, but I like that it's only 190 calories, which is 100 fewer calories per bottle than the competition. But you'd never know by tasting it. And Cafe Monster contains a third less sugar than the leading national brand. That's another reason I prefer it. Check out Cafe Monster's ready-to-drink coffee. Cafe Monster. Chill it down, shake it up, enjoy. 
true crime can be fascinating. That's probably why so many people listen to true crime podcasts. But crime in your neighborhood, like break-ins or robberies, isn't fascinating at all. It's just scary. Which is why I'm glad Simply Safe Home Security is a partner of this show. When you have Simply Safe, you don't think about crime. Just order it online, place it in your home, and get 24/7 protection. It's that easy. And what's great about Simply Safe is how it's ready for anything. Even if a storm knocks out your power, it's safe. If your Wi-Fi goes down, it's safe. If an intruder cuts your landline, Simply Safe calls police, and you're notified right away. Intruders are such an unpleasant thing to think about. Imagine how much more unpleasant it would be without Simply Safe. When there's no word from Simply Safe, you know all's well because Simply Safe is good at what it does, and they've been in business for a decade. We're proud to have them as a partner. So do us a favor. If you're interested in Simply Safe, visit simplysafe.com/cults. Let them know we sent you. That's simplysafe.com/cults. Now back to the story. It was in San Francisco at an amusement park in 1950 that 20-year-old Levee met a blonde 15-year-old named Carol Lansing. She was the daughter of a Wells Fargo bank executive who was described by friends as a miniature Jane Mansfield. This was many years before Levee would become involved with the real thing. Despite the fact that Carol Lansing was underage, Levee began a relationship with her, and they were married a year later. Now, this was right around the time of the Korean War, and Anton Levee was desperate to avoid being drafted into the army. Before Congress reformed the draft in 1971, a man was eligible for student deferment if he could demonstrate he was a full-time student making satisfactory progress in his field of study. So Levee signed up to study criminology at San Francisco's City College, where he established himself as a respectable student. Anton's first daughter, Carla Maritza, was born in 1952. In order to support his new family, he took up a position with the San Francisco Police Department as a police photographer. In this job, he was confronted with the worst side of humanity on a daily basis. Levee saw children splattered on the road by hit-and-run drivers, women cut to pieces by jealous husbands, and the bloated bodies of suicide victims fished out of the San Francisco Bay. Speaking about this time, he said he came to the conclusion that. If brutal carnage like this was God's will, then he wanted nothing more to do with God. Levee said, quote, "There is no God. There is no supreme, all-powerful deity in the heavens that cares about the lives of human beings. There is nobody up there who gives a shit. Man must be taught to answer to himself and other men for his actions." End quote. Again, it is important to mention that many of these facts might be some distance from the truth. When writing a piece about Levee for Rolling Stone magazine in 1991, journalist Lawrence Wright checked with the San Francisco Police Department and discovered that no one named Howard, Anton Levee, or Levy had ever worked for the force. Frank Moser, a retired police officer who worked in the photo department during that time, says that Levee was never in that department under any name. Not only that, City College has no record of his enrollment. Once again, it seems as if Anton Levee may have created a false narrative of the events that led him to become the high priest of the First Church of Satan. When asked about these inconsistencies by Lawrence Wright for his Rolling Stone article, Levee suggested that the police records were probably purged by the department to avoid embarrassment. This type of behavior is consistent with individuals suffering from narcissistic personality disorder. According to Psychology Today, narcissists are arrogant and preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited self-importance. This causes them to exaggerate their accomplishments and popularity. The truth is, it's highly unlikely that the San Francisco Police Department expunged Anton Levee's employment information from their records. Instead, through his own self-aggrandizement, he probably concocted a version of events that portrays him in the most impressive light possible. In 1952, Anton's responsibilities at the police department expanded when he was assigned to the Repeater 800 calls. These were the nut calls that no one else on the force wanted to deal with. Reports of ghosts, weird noises, UFO sightings, and various things that go bump in the night. 
Anton LaVey, unsurprisingly, was delighted with this opportunity and threw himself headlong into paranormal investigation. He would visit houses and set traps for ghosts, including a camera with a sensitive trigger loaded with infrared film to record ectoplasmic activity. However, Anton quickly discovered that the majority of paranormal phenomena that people reported were easily explainable. A rusty can whistling in the wind or a cat trapped in the attic. Early on, when he would present the residents with the simple cause of their problems, they were often disappointed. It was as if they wanted to be fooled. Anton was happy to fool them. He decided to play up his role as a ghost hunter and lead people to believe he was performing real exorcisms. Despite the lack of evidence for his abilities, people believed him. Within a few years, his reputation grew, and he had developed a steady clientele. By 1955, Anton LaVey decided to focus all his energy on further explorations into the black arts. He realized that the majority of progress in science and philosophy had been achieved by those who rebelled against God and the Church. Albert Einstein, for example, once wrote, quote, the word God is, for me, nothing more than the expression and product of human weaknesses, end quote. LeVay felt that there needed to be a representative for that revolutionary, creative, irrepressible spirit within us, and he knew the single figure that could be that representative. In 1956, LeVay purchased a weathered, slate-gray Victorian house at 6114 California Street in the Richmond District of San Francisco. He was immediately intrigued by the house after hearing it had been formerly occupied by Mary Ellen Pleasant, better known as Mammy Pleasant. She was San Francisco's most notorious madam during the Barbary Coast days and had outfitted the house with secret panels, trap doors, and hidden rooms. These were used to rob customers while they were being entertained. These architectural eccentricities fit perfectly with the enigmatic image that LeVay was attempting to cultivate. The first thing Anton did after moving in was to paint the house black. On Halloween in 1956, Anton and his wife Carol threw a midnight party to show off their new home in style. From this day forward, it became known as the Black House. Ten years later, this would be the birthplace of the first organized church in modern times to be devoted to Satan. In the late 50s, a crowd of influential and eccentric people were beginning to gather around Anton LaVey. They were grateful to have a place where they could share iconoclastic interests and hobbies with like-minded individuals. They included underground experimental filmmaker Kenneth Anger, novelist Stephen Schneck, wealthy investor Donald Werby, and Danish baroness Karen de Plessen, to name but a few. All of them were drawn to Anton's gatherings because of his growing reputation as San Francisco's black magician. This extraordinary group of people who socialized at the Black House on Friday evenings came to be known as the Magic Circle. Each member wore a trapezoid surrounded by a bat-winged demon that could be removed to reveal an inverted pentagram design underneath. Anton was beginning to assemble his followers. During the time he was developing his magic circle, Anton had maintained a job playing music at Maury's Point, a restaurant overlooking the Pacific Ocean. One Sunday night in 1959, a young woman came in who would go on to play a very important role in Anton's life. Her name was Diane Hegarty, a beautiful 17-year-old girl with long blonde hair and green eyes. She worked as an usherette at the nearby Seaview Theater, that night, she was on a date with her manager from the theater. However, when Anton came to their table and regaled them with stories of ghost hunting, Diane could not hide her enthusiasm. She returned to Maury's Point several more times to see Anton and eventually began a relationship with him. Over the coming months, Anton spent as much free time as he could with Diane. Since he was still married to Carol, Anton was forced to sneak Diane out through the secret passages of the house and then smuggle her into the trunk of his car. Anton was quickly falling for Diane, primarily due to her unbridled devotion and unquestioning support of all he was doing. In 1960, Anton divorced Carol Lansing so he could be with Diane. While Diane Hegarty never married Anton LaVey, she would mother his second daughter, Zena Galatea Schreck in 1963. With Diane as his new hostess, 
Anton's magic circle meetings were picking up steam. At first, there was no set itinerary, and conversations flowed freely over cocktails, accompanied by Anton or another member of the group playing a Hammond or piano in the corner. These meetings quickly gained legendary status in San Francisco. At this point, Anton began giving more formalized seminars and opening them to the public, charging $2.50 a head to hear him speak about fortune-telling and character analysis, or love potions and monkey glands. Vampires, werewolves, freaks, homunculi, bondage and torture, moon madness. It was a veritable smorgasbord of the weird, the forbidden, and the occult. People would spill over to the stairway outside and listen through the windows. It's likely that Anton relished every moment of this adulation. According to Psychology Today, narcissists have an unquenching desire for admiration and worship. Anton clearly wanted to be the center of attention, and now that he had an audience, he would do whatever he had to do in order to maintain it. He knew that the best way to do this was to lean into his reputation as a man of the occult and to perform outlandish stunts that would get people talking. This is perhaps best exemplified in his seminar on cannibalism and human sacrifices, in which he covered the subject in surprisingly thorough detail. As part of the lecture, students of LeVay were invited to dine on a cooked thigh of a young woman. The leg had been biopsied and provided by a Berkeley physician who attended Anton's lectures regularly. Diane served it with fried bananas and yams, just as the Fiji Islanders did, adding tonka bean wine and caterpillars to complete the meal. The hubbub created around the stunt made Anton realize that perhaps his greatest asset in assembling new adoring followers would be publicity. And soon, he began to get it. In 1964, Monique Benoit, society columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle, was the first to write about Anton. She referenced his latest job as a psychic investigator and the fact that he was now holding strange rituals in his menacing black house. Even legendary journalist Herb Kane included him in his daily gossip column, describing Anton attending the opera resplendent in a formal black cape with scarlet lining and carrying an antique sword cane. Not content with this conspicuous reputation, Anton decided to take it one step further. He adopted a pet he would walk through the San Francisco streets, but not just any pet, a black leopard named Zoltan. Anton treated him like just another child, so much so that Zoltan slept in the same crib as his daughter, Carla. One night in 1964, when Anton was elsewhere, Zoltan darted out into the street and was killed by a passing car. Anton quickly replaced him with a 10-week-old Nubian lion named Togar. Those who visited Anton were impressed by his ability to handle the lion in his own house. However, its presence betrayed some questionable judgment on Anton's behalf, particularly when Togar left a scar on Carla's back. Even after this, LeVay continued to let the lion sleep in her room. It appears that LeVay was more concerned with showing off his pet than the safety of his own child. According to Scientific American, exhibitionism such as this is typical of the grandiose narcissist. Grandiose narcissism is a flamboyant, assertive, and interpersonally dominant style. These individuals have an inflated sense of self, are overconfident in making decisions, and have a hard time learning from their mistakes. Unfortunately for Anton, but perhaps fortunately for his daughter Carla, Togar had the habit of roaring loudly at night, which disturbed his neighbors. Eventually, a city ordinance was passed forbidding lions in private homes. Togar was taken from Anton and brought to the zoo. This swelling publicity brought even more people to Anton's lectures. They would quiz him about magic spells, hypnosis, and other phenomena. It was around this time that LeVay had a life-altering interaction with one of these patrons, a police officer named Jack Webb. Webb and LeVay would regularly chat about magic and the occult. One night, speaking off the cuff, Webb said, quote, why don't you make some use of all this magic stuff and the philosophy you've spun around it? You know, you've got the material for the founding of a whole new religion. Do you realize that? End quote. 
While it seems almost inevitable that Anton LaVey probably would have gone on to found the Church of Satan regardless, he credits this interaction with Jack Webb as being the catalyst to what would eventually become the first public, highly visible, and long-lasting organization which propounded a coherent satanic discourse. Anton knew his ideas could not be just a philosophy. That would be too easy for people to pass off or overlook. He would have to form a new religion. What's more, he would call his new organization a church, consecrated not in the name of God, but in the name of Satan. There has always been a satanic underground. In the mid-18th century, Sir Francis Dashwood formed the Hellfire Club. Several of England's most influential men would gather for satanic feasting, reveling, and debauchery. However, there had never been an organized satanic religion that practiced openly. Anton decided it was high time there was. Anton already knew the date upon which his Church of Satan would be established. It would be during the traditional night of the most important demonic celebration of the year, the night when witches and devils roamed the earth, orgiastically glorifying the fruition for the spring equinox. Valpurgisnacht, also known as St. Valpurga's Eve. St. Valperga was an 8th century Anglo-Saxon missionary to the Frankish Empire. Her canonization is celebrated on the night of April 30th and the day of May 1st. Anton shaved his head as part of the founding ritual, in the tradition of medieval executioners, carnival strongmen, and black magicians before him. He did this to gain personal power and enhance the forces surrounding his newly established satanic order. This bald head, along with an immaculately sculpted black goatee, would become his signature look for the remainder of his life. Anton LaVey founded the Church of Satan on the night of April 30th, 1966. He proclaimed this to be year one, or Anno Satanas, the first year of the Age of Satan. Within a year and a half of its creation, the organization would be at the center of three separate media sensations that would be splashed across front pages the world over. We'll follow these scandals after the break. Now back to the story. It was 1966, and Anton LaVey had just formed the Church of Satan, performing ceremonies from his home, the Black House, in San Francisco. A typical Friday night ceremony would go as follows. The Satanists gather in the antechamber. The men are dressed in dark suits. The women are more provocative, wearing bright colors, spiked heels, and short skirts. A tall, black-robed figure enters and announces that the ceremony is about to begin. The congregation silently follow the figure into the darkened chapel and take their seats. Then the silence is broken by the booming chords of an organ. The music ends with thundering fanfare. After a beat, a gong sounds three times. The lights come up to reveal the celebrants assembled at the front of the ritual chamber. The central figure is a large man. His shaven head is fitted with a black cowl coming to a sharp point at his forehead, with horns made of bone on either side. The cowl extends to a floor-length cape lined with crimson satin lining. His presence is one of quiet but irresistible command. He is the high priest, Anton Zandor LaVey. An organist in a black hood begins to play the hymn to Satan, while two naked female acolytes stand reverently near the altar. The high priest rings a bell six times, Satan's number, to clear the air. He steps toward his followers and summons them forth to speak their deepest desires before their dark lord. The congregants begin to whisper their desires and dreams to LaVey. These desires ranged from help me do well in my new job to make the man in the apartment across the hall fall madly in love with me. The goal is to be as selfish as possible. No false modesty or selflessness. What do you truly desire more than anything? LaVey encouraged his followers to harness their inner demons to help them gain worldly power for themselves. After each desire is repeated aloud by the high priest, shouts of Hail Satan are echoed by the congregants. When the music ends and the last ring of the bell fades to silence, LaVey pronounces, So it is done. With that, the ceremony comes to an end. 
To many, this ritual may seem trivial, even laughable. A room full of adults confessing their secret desires to a man dressed in black in the hopes that it will make them come true. For Anton, this was merely an extension of his days as a ghost hunter. His followers were willing to believe, and Anton was happy to let them. In situations such as this, the leader-follower relationship is a symbiotic one. According to Psychology Today, fanatic followers typically suffer from a profound sense of inferiority, frustration, emptiness, meaninglessness, and powerlessness. They feel small and insignificant. However, they perceive the narcissistic personality as someone who embodies the exact opposite of these negative feelings about themselves. They desperately need to admire and worship the narcissist, which is precisely what makes them so willing to be deceived and manipulated. These individuals live vicariously through the narcissist, reveling in his or her celebrity as if it was their own. These people need the narcissist in order to feel better about themselves and their own seemingly insignificant existence. For them, the narcissist fulfills the psychological, sometimes spiritual role of a savior or messiah. It's clear that Anton LaVey adored the attention bestowed on him by his followers and the press. Little did he know someone was about to enter his life that would give him more publicity than he could ever have dreamed of. In the fall of 1966, the actress Jane Mansfield requested to meet Anton LaVey. At this point, she was already established as the reigning platinum blonde in America for her starring roles in films such as The Girl Can't Help It and The Wayward Bus. Mansfield was in San Francisco preparing for the annual film festival when she became aware of the publicity around Anton and his Church of Satan. She insisted on meeting this satanic high priest to see what all the fuss was about. From the moment they met, Jane was intensely attracted to Anton, an attraction that would quickly grow into an obsession. During the first few hours they spent together, Jane Mansfield opened up to Anton LaVey about all of her deepest feelings. She told him of her overwhelming sexual passions, her fears concerning her ongoing custody battle with her ex-husband, Matt Simber, and her frustrating relationship with her attorney and current boyfriend, Sam Brody whose insane jealousy was becoming increasingly dangerous. Jane Mansfield first met Sam Brody in Las Vegas. He had offered to represent her in the case against Italian-born film director Matt Simber, who was claiming that Mansfield was an unfit mother. However, soon Brody fell in love with Mansfield, and although he was not her type, she agreed to a relationship with him because she imagined it would ensure her custody of her four children. Almost immediately, Mansfield began to have second thoughts. Brody showed a side of himself that was violently jealous, imposing impossible constraints on Jane. She was in the process of trying to ease out of the situation, but Brody was only becoming more protective, using her pending custody suit to maneuver her deeper into a relationship. Anton questioned Jane's judgment when it came to romantic partners, but remained sympathetic offering to do what he could to alleviate her troubles. Mansfield had no previous interest in the occult, but she had a sincere thirst for knowledge and was intrigued by the philosophy Anton espoused. At a loss for what else to do, Mansfield asked Anton to place a curse on Matt Simber so that he would lose the custody battle. Anton agreed. Within a few weeks, Jane was awarded custody of all of her children from her three marriages. She was convinced. Anton LaVey was the real deal. Jane Mansfield quickly became a full-fledged member of the Church of Satan, along with her road manager, Victory Houston. While she never attended public Church of Satan rituals, Anton arranged private ceremonies just for her. LaVey said, quote, Jane didn't want to get involved with groups of people for rituals, seminars, parties. The whole idea for her was to get away from crowds. That's why she didn't quietly slip into the back of the room during my seminars. She wanted to get me all to herself." End quote. Mansfield was by far the most famous person who had ever associated themselves with the church. The type of publicity that this celebrity endorsement could bring Anton and his organization was unimaginable. So it's no surprise that he bent over backwards to accommodate her. However, Sam Brody was less than thrilled about Anton's newfound influence over Mansfield. 
One day, when she requested a chauffeur to take her to the black house, Brody insisted he join her. While at the house, Brody wandered into the chapel where Anton performed his rituals and began to wave candles from the altar around in a mocking fashion. When LaVey found him, Brody had just lit a skull-shaped candle that was used for destruction rituals. A frustrated Anton blew the candle out. Brody was beginning to get on his nerves. LaVey told him, quote, You shouldn't have done that. You don't know what you've done. That candle is used only for curses. I don't know what's going to happen to you now. I only hope I've put it out in time, end quote. Brody's controlling behavior began to get out of hand, with him even going so far as to forbid Mansfield from wearing certain items of clothing. She would call LaVey at night, crying uncontrollably, complaining about the ways Brody was ruining her life. One particularly bad night in January 1967, Jane Mansfield had locked herself in the bathroom and made a desperate telephone call to LaVey. She begged him to come help her. LaVey could hear Brody screaming in the background, banging on the door. Finally, Brody broke the door open and grabbed the phone from her. He told LaVey, quote, She's never to talk to you again. You hear that? I don't ever want to catch you talking to her again. You're a charlatan and I can make plenty of trouble for you. I'll expose you." End quote. LaVey did not take kindly to Brody's insolence. He responded, quote, I don't have to listen to this. I won't let anybody call me a quack. It's too bad you're taking this attitude. I've tried to be pleasant to you, even at times when you deserve to be put down. But now you've gone too far. My power exceeds anything you can imagine, and now you're going to feel it. You will be dead in a year. Sam Brody, I pronounce that you will be dead within one year." End quote. Later that same night, LaVey conducted a private destruction ritual against Brody. This entailed ceremonially writing Brody's name on a piece of parchment and burning it in the flame of destruction. As the parchment was engulfed in flames, LaVey invoked the powers of the Infernal Ones, commanding that Brody, likewise, be destroyed within the specified time. Sam Brody had attacked Anton LaVey's reputation. This was unacceptable to LaVey. He wanted to teach Brody a lesson. Anton called Jane Mansfield to warn her of the curse he had placed on her boyfriend. While Brody eventually called LaVey three days later to apologize, Anton told him it was too late. The wheels had already been set in motion, and even if he wanted to, there was nothing LaVey could do to stop the curse. Within a few months, Jane Mansfield and Sam Brody would both be dead. Next week, we'll discuss the rest of Anton LaVey's journey and examine how he was able to generate a loyal following of people from all walks of life, including Hollywood stars. We'll also go more into depth about the practices and beliefs of the Church of Satan, who the members were and the reasons they joined, and how some people believe Anton LaVey was responsible for the death of Jane Mansfield and Sam Brody. Thanks again for tuning into Cults. We'll be back with another episode next Tuesday. Some of you have asked how you can help the show. If you enjoy Cults, the best way to help is to leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. You can find Cults and all of ParCast podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, CastBox, TuneIn, or on your favorite podcast directory. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram as at ParCast and Twitter at ParCast Network. We'll see you next time. Cults was created by Max Cutler and is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the ParCast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Russell Nash, with production assistance by Ron Shapiro and Paul Mahler. Additional production assistance by Maggie Admire and Carly Madden. Cults is written by John Purcell and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. 
Don't forget to check out Kingpins. You can listen to episodes on Pablo Acosta via Real, also known as El Zorro de Oinaga, the Oinaga Fox, and Richard the Iceman Kuklinski right now, with new episodes released every Friday. Search Kingpins wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe now. As promised, here's a brief sneak peek of the first episode of Kingpins on Richard the Iceman Kuklinski. We hope you enjoy it and be sure to tell your friends about it. It should have been a quick, easy kill. The man was staring down the barrel of Richard's gun, praying and pleading, please God, help me, over and over again. Richard could barely think it was so annoying. Please God, please. He should have just shot him to shut him up. But instead, he lowered the gun and told him, you have half an hour to pray. If God can come down and change the circumstances, you have that time. Richard sat down and waited. A half hour passed. God didn't show up. Richard never felt guilty after a murder. He never felt anything at all. But this time, for the first time in his life, he found himself regretting what he'd done. He shouldn't have let it go down like that. By the time he got back home to suburban Dumont, New Jersey, his wife and kids were already asleep. He changed his clothes, made himself a turkey sandwich, and sat down to watch some TV. He wondered to himself why he was so cold and cruel. He didn't think he could change, but he wished he could understand it. (laughs) 